Well, thank you for that generous introduction and inviting me. Uh, perhaps I ought to say that uh, when I was at Oxford, the term constitutional expert was applied to a historian who had given his telephone number to the journalists. <laughs> uh, and thank you for coming on such a hot day to uh, hear me. Uh, now, uh, it's clear that uh, in 2015, Magna Carta remains a living presence. And uh, some years ago, there was an opinion poll from 2006 suggesting most people believe that Magna Carta, 5th day, 15th of June, should be a national holiday. Mm -hmm. And that was a rebuke to people who thought that Magna Carta had been largely forgotten. And if it was remembered at all, it was only through the quip of the comedian Tony Hancock who asked Magna Carta, did she die in vain? <laughs> <laughs> now, a few years ago, I wrote an article in The Economist on the theme, and has the Arab Spring failed? And it said this, when you say that it takes decades, not years, to bring about democratic change, you are off by a factor of 10. It takes centuries. The imperfect democracy we enjoy in the West has its roots in the Middle Ages. The signing of the Magna Carta in 1215 by the English King John can be held as a good starting point. Now that, I think you all agree, is a rather absurd and anachronistic comment because Magna Carta is in no sense a democratic document. And it does show, however, that people often interpret it in terms of the present and not the past, in terms of what they thought it said or what <coughs> that it said. Magna Carta, I think just three remain and the rest have been repealed, and I think most have been superseded. The two most important clauses of the original document are 39 and 40. And 39 says, No free man shall be seized or imprisoned, or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled, or deprived of his standing in any other way. Nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so, except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. In clause 40 says, shorter, to no one will we sell, to no one deny or delay right or justice. Now the Charter also insists that the king cannot arbitrarily tax his subjects without their consent, in chapter 12. This raises the question, how is consent to be given? Presumably only by a body summoned for the purpose of giving consent. The implication is Parliament of some sort, and the Parliament did, I think, come into existence in the 13th century. Now, of course, that principle of no taxation without representation played an important role in the revolt of the American colonists against Britain in the 18th century, and the political philosopher Edmund Burke, who supported the colonists, said the Americans were absolutely entitled, and I quote, to sit down to the feast of Magna Carta. Now, I think it's this clause on taxation and the two clauses I quoted that express the fundamental principle which makes Magna Carta so important that government must be subject to law. And under Magna Carta, the executive, which of course then is the king, is put under constraint. He can no longer do what he likes. This principle played an important part, a particularly important part, I think, in the 17th century in the attack on the theory of the divine right of kings. Because the parliamentarians argued that Magna Carta laid down a principle so fundamental that no king could ever override it. And some argued there was a fundamental law based on Magna Carta which limited the rights of the king. Now, this was anachronistic because, again, much of Magna Carta had already been altered by subsequent legislation. But it came to be transformed from a baronial charter of privileges into a declaration of the rights of all free Englishmen. It became a myth, perhaps a necessary myth, perhaps a cult. And Whigs and radicals uh, derived strength from this view of English history, because they said when they opposed the king, they were merely resurrecting traditional principles of Anglo-Saxon freedom, principles which had been reaffirmed in the Magna Carta. So they were able to argue that far from being revolutionaries, they were appealing to principles already enshrined in English history. And this appeal to the past documents, whether the Bible in the 17th century or Magna Carta, became a criticism of existing types of institutions and certain types of rule. And then it 
the actual rule did not confer, conform to the sacred texts, it was to be rejected. And again, to quote Burke in his Reflections on the Revolution in France, published in 1990, <coughs> he stressed the desire to derive all we possess as an inheritance from our forefathers. Now, um, when uh, Whigs and Radicals said that there were these fundamental principles in Magna Carta, uh, they were somewhat vague about what they actually were. And in 1641, the Earl of Strafford was being impeached for breaking the fundamental law of the kingdom. And the House of Commons was about to vote on the issue whether he should be impeached. The MP and poet, Edmund Waller, asked what these fundamental laws actually were. And there was an embarrassed silence. But then a fellow MP, perhaps significantly a lawyer, rose and said that if Mr. Waller did not know what the fundamental laws of the kingdom were, he had no business to be sitting in the House of Commons at all. <laughs> and it was in terms of these fundamental laws that Charles I was to be accused of treason. And in 1649, the Commons declared that Charles Stuart, the now King of England, had a wicked design totally to subvert the ancient and fundamental laws and liberties of this nation, and in their place to introduce an arbitrary and tyrannical government. And that idea of fundamental law survived the revolution. In 1681, Parliament sought to impeach the Chief Justice. I hope that won't happen again today. But he too was charged with having traitorously and wickedly endeavoured to subvert the fundamental laws and the established religion and government of this kingdom. Finally, as is well known, when the Commons condemned James II in 1689, one of the charges against him was that of having violated the fundamental laws. Now, many of those who preach this doctrine of fundamental laws believe it, it to be embodied in the common law, a body of judicial doctrine based on principle. And for those who thought in this way, a statute did not create law, but declare what the law actually was. And the task of common law judges was to act as an ultimate court of appeal in constitutional matters. The Supreme Court, as they are like the American Court, is the law of sovereign, and the judges alone would understand its mysteries. And that idea of the common law constitution has been resurrected in our own times, uh, most notably by Lord Justice Lord. And many have seen the origins of that particular idea to lie with Sir Edward Cook, who was Chief Justice under James I. And Cook declared the Magna Carta in 1628 that it is such a fellow that he will have no sovereign, and was Magna Carta the sovereign, not king. But Cook's ideas were, I think, rather confused, and it never, I think, occurred to him that there could in fact be a clash between the common law and the executive. And his hostility was directed, certainly not at Parliament, the sovereignty of Parliament, but at the royal prerogative. The first people to use uh, the idea of Magna Carta as a weapon against the sovereignty of Parliament were the 17th century levellers. And it's to them that we, and I think the Americans, owe the idea of fundamental law and of a written constitution. Now, in 1647, the levellers drew up the first of three agreements of the people, according to which Parliament was to be limited by fundamental law which was unalterable. And under the terms of that agreement, Parliament could not legislate against the freedom of religion. It could not exempt anyone from the due process of the law. It could not abridge the freedom to trade abroad. And it could not impose the death penalty except for murder. Above all, perhaps, it could not abolish trial by jury. Now, a third agreement of the people, drawn up in 1653, went further and declared that all laws made or that shall be made contrary to any part of this agreement are thereby made null and void. In other words, judicial review, judges can strike down such laws. And I think that third agreement is perhaps the first modern constitution in, in the European history. People sometimes say our first constitution was Oliver Cromwell's constitution of 1653, the Institute of Government. And indeed, Cromwell told the first parliament of his protectorate in 1654 that in every government 
there must be somewhat fundamental, somewhat like a Magna Carta that should be standing and be inalterable. And that instrument of Cromwell's did also contain unalterable provisions, such as that providing for freedom of conscience in religion, and parliaments should not make themselves perpetual, because Cromwell said, of what assurance is a law to prevent so great an evil if it lie in one and the same legislator to outlaw it again? But uh, Cromwell, I think, is not a very happy founder of the first constitution, because it came after he'd abolished the House of Lords, and shortly after his constitution, he abolished the House of Commons, so I think his title to be a constitutionalist is a bit dubious. Now, after the Restoration in 1689, the idea of fundamental law receded. But even so, the myth of Magna Carta survived. Burke, whom I've already quoted twice, said in his reflections on the revolution in France, our oldest reformation is that of Magna Carta. Now, the idea was resurrected across the Atlantic by the American revolutionaries, and indeed, it's arguable Magna Carta had more influence in America than in Britain the ideas of the levelers were to be embodied in the American Constitution. But in Britain, following the glorious revolution of 1689, the Whig triumph was symbolised by the Bill of Rights. Now that was very different from the American Bill of Rights, because it did not serve to entrench fundamental rights against legislative majorities. Instead, it was a statute guaranteeing the rights of Parliament against the King. No limitations were placed upon the king in Parliament as a legislator, but pa powers remained unlimited. But the balance of power was altered in favour of Parliament and against arbitrary rule by the king. So it secured the powers of the legislature against the king and emphasised the doctrine of the undivided sovereignty of Parliament. And uh, later on, in the 18th and 19th centuries, ideals of fundamental law came to be superseded by utilitarianism, a scientific philosophy for whom the whole idea of rights as a standard by which to judge law was a superstition. Bentham's famous comment that natural uh, rights were nonsense and natural rights were nonsense on stills. <laughs> but um, in the 20th century, certainly the second half of the 20th century, utilitarianism has been in retreat and the dominant philosophies of law and government, such as those of Rawls and, and Walking in, in America in particular, repudiate it and find a lot more um, uh, um, attractive, attractiveness in older ideas of fundamental rights. Now, it's very difficult to accommodate rights within utilitarianism. And indeed, as Bentham argued, if Parliament is sovereign, how can you have rights against Parliament? Bentham said the only rights you could legal rights, rights recognised in law. The idea of a moral right against Parliament was nonsense. So there was a conflict between utility uh, and rights. But the climate today, the intellectual climate today, I think, makes it easier to understand what a number of British thinkers about sovereignty, beginning with Hobbes, I think, didn't understand, how the ideas of parliamentary sovereignty and the rule of law come into, can come into conflict with each other. And if you believe in parliamentary sovereignty, it's very difficult to understand. So this principle, which is somehow there in Magna Carta, that government should be subject to law, and in my view, it's a more important principle than the democratic principle, because the danger of the democratic principle is the assumption sometimes made that a majority that has won power in a free election has the right to govern as it likes, as it wishes. And it's worth remembering that the Nazi party, in two indubitably free elections in 1932, secured a far higher vote than any other political party in Germany. And before Hitler came to power, he said that if we came to power legally, we could then break through legality. The fundamental principle of democracy, he said, runs all power from the people. And then during the war, in January 1941, Hitler said, the National Socialist Revolution defeated democracy through democracy. And it's also worth noting more recently, in 1980, that Iranians voted in a free election for a democratic republic in which human rights are barely existent. Now, government under the law, then, means much more than elections. It means also there must be respect and freedom for the opposition parties, free access to the press and other media, 
an independent judiciary with the power to check government, civilian control of the armed forces, the removal of the military from politics, and above all, respect for human rights. And a well-functioning democracy cannot exist without these other phenomena. Indeed, I think it's arguable that the vote is the last rather than the first stage of creating a liberal democracy, because universal franchise without the rule of law is as likely to lead to tyranny or anarchy as it is to democracy. And both Britain and the United States had governments subject to law long before they became democracies. Indeed, you may argue Britain did not become a full democracy until comparatively recently in 1928, when women were given the women over 21 were given the vote on the same basis as men. But long before that, British government had been regulated by the rule of law. And of course, one of the signs of a constitutional democracy is that no one is above the law. And in the 1970s, Richard Nixon, President of America, said when he was accused of criminal offences after the Watergate break-in, that if the President does something, it cannot be illegal. And the Watergate prosecutors proved him wrong, and he was forced to resign the presidency to avoid impeachment. <laughs> And in Britain, Lord Denning, as master of the rolls, reminded a minister in one case in the 1970s, be you ever so high, the law is above you. And of course, this principle that no government's above the law is embodied in most democracies in a written constitution, which we, of course, do not have. We are one of just three democracies without one, the others being New Zealand and Israel. And someone once said, the British constitution is not worth the paper it isn't written on. <laughs> now, um, there are a number of reasons why I think we haven't thought it desirable to put this principle of uh, the rule of law into a constitution. And the, I think the main reason is that we've never really had a constitutional moment since the 17th century. That our system of government is marked by evolution and adaptation without sharp breaks since the Civil War of the 17th century. And significantly after that experiment with the Republic, we refer to 1660 as a restoration, as if there'd been no break at all. We, we've never had the breaks of continental countries. France, by contrast, has had 16 constitutions since 1789, since the French Revolution. And the story, the, the fifth, current Fifth Republic is actually the second longest lasting one though it has existed only for 57 years. Uh, the story is told of someone who in the 1950s went to a shop in Paris to ask for a copy of the Constitution and was told, I'm afraid we do not sell periodicals here. <laughs> and, um, this um, this uh, pattern of constitutional development does differentiate Britain sharply from the continent. You look at many countries on the continent, how recent their constitutions are. France, 1958. Germany, 1949. Italy, 1947. Most of the ex-communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe from the 1990s. Whereas our system of government goes back to the same institutions, a monarchy, back before the Norman conquest, parliament in medieval times, quite different. And this, I think, explains some of our difficulties uh, in the European Union. And um, the 19th century constitutional theorist Dicey said that our constitution was a historic constitution. And by that, he meant not merely that our system of government was very old, but it was a product of evolution, not designed or planned. It developed spontaneously. People can get together. And no time people got together that this should be our system of government. It never happened. It developed spontaneously. There's a second reason of principle, not a historical reason why we don't have a constitution. And it is very obviously <coughs> that if you hold the principle of the sovereignty of Parliament, there's no point having a constitution. Because the British constitution could be summarised in eight words what the Queen and Parliament enacts is law. Uh, and there's, there's no if, you, if you do ever, ever have a constitution, the first consequence must be to, uh, that Parliament must abdicate, formally abdicate its sovereignty. Um, it was said uh, in the 18th century, one constitutional theorist, so if Parliament can do anything it likes except turn a man into a woman or a woman into a man. But even that's not true because if Parliament said for the purpose of the law a man is a woman and a woman is a man, that would actually be the case. So you may say, well, uh, what value does Magna Carta have? 
if it is actually at the mercy of Parliament, or in effect of government, since after all most governments do have a majority in Parliament. And governments in Britain have been limited not by constitution, but by non-legal rules called conventions. And in conventions, there are certain things that no government would ever do. They're not illegal. The British government or Parliament could pass an enactment saying that all red-headed people should be executed next Monday. But in practice, it would not do that, no. But the trouble with conventions is that their precise scope and nature are not always clear. And over a hundred years ago, one constitutional theorist declared that Britain was governed by a system of tacit understandings. But he said these understandings were not always understood. <laughs> and uh, perhaps the same is partly true today. But what we've seen, I think, in the last 45 years, and in particular, I think, the years since 1997, has been a constitutional revolution in Britain. The revolution began with our entry into the European community, as the European <coughs> Union was then called, in 1973, and continued with the devolution legislation in the late 90s, and fundamentally, I think, with the Human Rights Act. And I think these changes have fundamentally altered our system of government and our constitution and the role of the rule of law in it. You may remember the story of Rip Van Winkle, who fell asleep for 20 years in 18th century America. And when he went to sleep, he remembered a pub called the George, and it had a picture of George III on it. When he woke up after 20 years, the pub was still called the George, but the picture of George III been replaced by one of George Washington. <laughs> now, I think we don't notice the changes, the same changes in our system, because we do not have a constitution. And um, the 19th century constitutional thinker, Walter Badgett, said, an ancient and ever-altering constitution, such as the British, is like an old man who wears with attacked fondness clothes in the fashion of his youth. What you see of him is the same, what you do not see is wholly altered. And uh, first, our entry into the European community marked a very fundamental difference, which we're, changed, which we're only just beginning to notice, because it meant that there was a system of law, at least from the point of view of the European community, which was superior to that of Parliament. And this is very clear in uh, our attitude, for example, to immigration. Now, there are many people who say we would like to restrict immigration from the European Union into Britain. But this is something Parliament cannot do because it offends against the principle of the free movement of peoples, which is in the Treaty of Rome, which we have signed up to. So something that Parliament might want to do is something it cannot do, but for better or worse. Now, from the point of view, perhaps, of the British Parliament, Parliament remains supreme. It could, in theory, perhaps, Perhaps it will repeal the European Community Act, but at the moment there is something that Parliament cannot do. And there was an important case in 1991, the so called Thatatane case, where for the first time in British history the courts refused to apply part of the statute, the Merchant Shipping Act, because it was contrary to European law. And this act restricted the rights of foreign fishermen to fish in British territorial waters. And the Spanish merchant ship brought a case against Britain. Yeah, the European court, as you'd expect, said this was illegal under European law, discriminatory. But what wasn't expected was the British court would all also say, we're not going to apply this law because the presumption is that Britain has intended to abide by the rules of the European Union. So that's a fundamental change. And it limits, in my opinion, sovereignty. But more fundamental still, I think, is the Human Rights Act of 1998. Because previously, our rights were residual, that you could do anything you weren't prohibited from doing by law. But the Human Rights Act sets out a list of positive principles based on the European Convention on Human Rights that determine what our rights are and it's for the judges to interpret legislation in terms of what is a higher law, the principles of the European Convention of Human Rights. Now, again, if you say that Parliament's sovereign, there can be no such higher law. There can be no law which Parliament can't change, no fundamental or constitutional law. Now, the Human Rights Act preserves that formally 
because the judges, if they don't, if they believe that a statute or part of a statute <coughs> goes against the European Convention, they can't do what, for example, the American or German courts can do. They can't strike it down. What they can do is issue a declaration of incompatibility. They can say this statute is incompatible with the European Convention. Now, such a declaration has no legal force. It's a statement. It's a pure statement, no legal force. It's then up to Parliament to decide how to act. And there's a special uh, speedy process by which Parliament can, if it wishes, overturn uh, the offending statute or part of the statute. And in fact, on every occasion, it's fair to say, since the courts have issued such a declaration, on every occasion so far, Parliament has actually done it. It has put things right. It doesn't have to, but it has done so. It may be a convention is growing. But Parliament should always do that. We, we don't yet uh, know whether that's true or not. And um, the Human Rights Act, therefore, established a peculiarly British kind of compromise between two incompatible principles, the sovereignty of Parliament and the rule of law. And I once asked a senior judge what would happen if these principles conflict, which they could easily do. Uh, let's say that... Um, the courts found that a particular statute dealing with suspected terrorists uh, went against the European Convention. And uh, MPs then said, this is shocking, this is handicapping our ability to deal with terrorism. We can't have this. And the popular papers uh, had headlines saying, you write your MP uh, tell telling them to ignore these uh, radical um, judges with their in the air and so on, and, and you tell them to, to go ahead on the same. Now that could easily happen, uh, populist pressure against an unpopular judicial decision. And I once asked a senior judge, what happens if these two principles conflict, the sovereignty of Parliament and the rule of law? And the judge smiled at me and said, that is a question that ought not to be asked. <laughs> a uh, response to a logical uh, dilemma. Um, so that, uh, too, um, uh, is um, And as I say, I think the Human Rights Act is the most fundamental part of our new uh, constitution, which provides for a compromise between two doctrines which you may think of uh, are conflicting. Now, what it means is that the main burden of protecting human rights is now with the judges, whose role is going to become more influential. Now, many of these cases that judges deal with in connection with human rights are, as I implied in what I said about terrorism, they, are, they deal with the rights of very small and very unpopular minorities. <coughs> suspected terrorists, prisoners, asylum seekers, even if you like suspected paedophiles. And life would be much simpler if the victims of injustice were always attractive or nice people like ourselves. But they aren't. <laughs> And probably our legal system is rather good at securing justice for nice people like ourselves. But the Human Rights Act seeks to provide rights for everyone, whether they're nice or not. And that is, I think, the problem. Now, I think, as I indicated, the compromise of the Human Rights Act is fairly tenuous. And I thought, when the Act was passed, that the, there would be a conflict between government and the judges. But I thought the conflict would not occur for quite a long time. And on that, I was wrong. Conflicts occurred much sooner than I thought. And as you know, the present government is promising to repeal the Human Rights Act and to replace it with the British Bill of Rights and Responsibilities, whose scope is as yet unclear. Now, I think it's remarkable how rapidly the Human Rights Act has led to a conflict between the government basing itself on the principle of the sovereignty of Parliament <coughs> and the judges basing themselves on the principle of the rule of law. And um, uh, this, this has come very, very rapidly. And um, the, it's come about because the Act presupposes and assumes that there's a basic consensus between Parliament and the judges, and that any infringements of human rights uh, occur inadvertently and unintended. And therefore, there's not going to be much disagreement between the government and the judges. But I think there is no such consensus when you come to the rights of unpopular minorities, and I suspect 
one took a survey here, people would disagree very strongly on these issues. And two matters in particular, issues concerning asylum seekers and issues concerning suspected terrorism have come to the fore since the Human Rights Act came into force. And these problems, of course, predated the Act, but they've grown in significance since the Act was passed, and they're very emotive. And politicians believe that if they don't take action against them, they will lose support in the country. And terrorism in particular, as we've seen in recent days, has taken on a different form uh, since um, the Human Rights Act was passed. We were accustomed before that to a different form of terrorism, the IRA, which was in a way an old, what one might call an old-fashioned form of terrorism, with a single specific and concrete aim, namely the reunification of the island of Ireland. But now we face a problem of global terrorism, more ruthless in form, with wide, if not unlimited, aims, amongst which is the establishment of a new caliphate, and apparently has terror their terrorist cells in a large number of countries. And to deal with this new form of terrorism, the government argues, new methods are needed which may well infringe traditional views about human rights. Now the judges reply, we should not compromise our traditional principle, a uh, principle which has been tried and tested over many centuries and served as well. And some senior judges have gone further. They've said that the natural consequence of the Human Rights Act should be an erosion of the principle of the sovereignty of Parliament. They say the sovereignty of Parliament is a construct of the common law, and if the judges can create it, they can equally justifiably supersede it. And in a landmark case in 2005, Jackson versus Attorney General, which dealt with hunting, but that's not strictly relevant, it dealt with the validity of the Hunting Act. And judges, for the first time, declared obiter that Parliament's ability to pass legislation is limited in substance. And um, Lord Stay, the senior uh, judge on the Supreme Court, said the principle of the sovereignty of Parliament while still being the general principle of our Constitution, was a construct of the common law. The judges created this principle. If that is so, it is not unthinkable that circumstances could arise when the courts may have to qualify a principle established on a different hypothesis of constitutionalism. And he said, in exceptional circumstances, involving an attempt to abolish judicial review of the ordinary role of the courts, the appellate committee of the House of Lords or a new Supreme Court may have to consider whether this is a constitutional fundamental which even a sovereign parliament acting at the behest of a complacent House of Commons cannot abolish. And he since elaborated by saying this would be so if the government tried to tamper with the fundamental principles of constitutional democracy, such as five-year parliaments, the role of the ordinary courts, and the rule of law. And another senior judge, Lady Hale, said, the courts will treat with particular suspicion and might even reject any attempt to subvert the rule of law by removing governmental action affecting the rights of the individual from all judicial powers. And a Scottish judge, I think significantly a Scottish judge, because the Scots are always the more sceptical of the sovereignty of Parliament, Lord Hope, said parliamentary sovereignty is no longer, if it ever was, absolute. It is not uncontrolled. It is no longer right to say that its freedom to legislate admits of no qualifications whatever. Step by step, gradually but surely, the English principle of the absolute legislative sovereignty of Parliament is being qualified. And he said the rule of law enforced by the courts is the ultimate controlling actor on which our constitution is based. Now, the implication of these remarks is the sovereignty of Parliament is a doctrine created by judges which can be superseded by the judges. And they'd like to see this done. But the great uh, constitutionalist uh, in the 19th century, Dicey, who really was the first to elaborate on the doctrine of the sovereignty of Parliament, he said, the roots of the idea of parliamentary sovereignty lie deep in the history of the English people and in the peculiar development of the English constitution. Now, can the judges on their own supersede that principle? <coughs> now, survey evidence indicates, perhaps you won't be surprised to hear, that judges are trusted more than politicians. <laughs> now, even so, 
Would the people be prepared to grant the judges extra powers? Probably not. In 1997, the Labour government produced a white paper uh, bringing rights home, the Fall Human Rights Act, in which it said there was no evidence the public wanted judges to have the power to invalidate legislation. And perhaps nothing has changed since then. Perhaps that's still the case. But whatever the state of public opinion, it's clear, surely, that there's a conflict between these constitutional principles, the sovereignty of the parliament, and the rule of law. And uh, this conflict could, in my view, give rise to a constitutional crisis. And what I mean by a constitutional crisis is not simply there are differences of view on constitutional matters. That is to be expected and inevitable in any healthy democracy We differ about the Constitution. I don't mean that. What I mean is the difference of view as to how the conflict should be settled. Now, in any society, a balance has to be drawn between the rights of the individual and the needs of society for protection against terrorism, crime, and so on. But the question is, who do you believe should draw the balance? The judges or the government? Now, senior judges, I suspect, would say they've got a special role in protecting the rights of unpopular minorities. And they would say in doing so, they are no more than doing no more than applying the Human Rights Act as Parliament has asked them to do. The government, and one suspects most MPs and much of the press, would disagree. They would say it's for them as elected representatives to weigh the precise balance between the rights of the individual and the needs of society. They would say they are elected and accountable to the people when the judges are not. And they would say the Human Rights Act provides for the judges to review legislation, but should not be an excuse for judicial supremacy. And they say if the judges or anyone else believes there's a case for the Supreme Court of American lines, they should make that case publicly and seek the explicit approval of parliament and people. They should not seek to expand their role by stealth. And there is thus a profound difference of view as to how these questions should be resolved. The government say they should be resolved by Parliament. The judges think they should be settled by the courts. And for that reason, both sides are coming to believe that the other side is undermining the Constitution. Government and Parliament say that judges are usurping power and seeking to thwart the will of Parliament. <coughs> judges say the government is infringing human rights and then attacking the judiciary for doing its job in reviewing legislation for its compatibility with the Human Rights Act. So that the British Constitution is coming to mean different things to different people. It is coming to mean something different to the judges from what it means to government, parliament and many of the public. So the argument from parliamentary sovereignty points in one direction argument from the rule of law points in another. So there's going to be a conflict. How will it be resolved? And there are two outcomes. The first is Parliament will succeed in defeating the challenge of the judges and parliamentary sovereignty is preserved. And the corollary would be that Parliament refuses on some future occasion to take notice of a declaration of incompatibility. A second possible outcome is the Human Rights Act comes to trump Parliament and in practice, a declaration of incompatibility by a judge comes to be the equivalent of striking down legislation. It's too early to tell which outcome is more likely to prevail. And what seems to be unlikely is that the compromise involved in the Human Rights Act can survive in the long run. I think we're at present in a transitional period, and eventually, no doubt, the Constitution will be settled. And that could prove a painful process, and the path may be a difficult one with many squalls and storms on the way. Now, I think different members of the audience will have different views as to how this conflict should be resolved. And perhaps it's not my job to persuade you of uh, one view or the other. But let me make one point in conclusion, and let me make it, make it by quoting from Kipling's famous poem called The Reeds of Runnymede, when he said this, Part of her. When through our ranks the barons came, with little thought of praise or blame, but resolute to play the game, they lumbered up to Runnymede, and there they launched in solid time the first attack on right divine. 
the curt, uncompromising sign that settled John at Runnymede. At Runnymede, at Runnymede, your rights were won at Runnymede. Uh, the whole poem is well worth reading. Now, uh, as I said earlier, in the 17th century, constitutional reformers repudiated the doctrine of the divine right of kings. Right divine, as Kipling calls it. Now, do we replace that for the divine right of the people or parliament or governments against which the doctrine of parliamentary <coughs> sovereignty offers no protection? Are we going to yield to governments what we didn't in the past yield to kings, namely untrammeled power? Now, one response might be, well, governments, unlike kings, are democratically elected. But as I said earlier, and I quoted from Hitler, that a democracy it can be as despotic if not more despotic than traditional government. And uh, Hitler's dictatorship was the worst, I think in the 20th century, perhaps the worst in history which came to power as a result of free elections. And uh, therefore, it seems to me that if you believe in the rule of law, ultimate power should lie not with parliament nor with the people, but a constitution, whether written or unwritten. Now, I accept that a constitution is not sufficient to protect human rights because after all the state which Hitler took over already had a very democratic and liberal <coughs> constitution. And uh, a constitution may be necessary, that's arguable, but it certainly isn't sufficient. And the condition of society matters also, and that's where Britain perhaps does work for them well. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, John Stuart Mill famously criticised Bentham for believing that the Constitution was a mere set of rules or laws rather than a living organism representative of an evolving political morality. And Dicey said that the quality of a legal system depended on the quality of the society which it served. And he made what you may think is an arrogant statement uh, that British were more confident in the 19th century than now now. He said, the rule of law or the predominance of the legal spirit may be described as a special attribute of English institutions. And what he meant was that our laws rested upon a public opinion that supported the protection of human rights. And he wrote, he wrote his famous book on the Constitution called Law of the Constitution, but he wrote another important book called Law and Public Opinion in the 19th Century to complement it because he said the protection of rights depends not only on laws and institutions, but a spirit favourable to human rights. And perhaps that spirit originated with Magna Carta, and perhaps that is why we are celebrating Magna Carta in the 800th anniversary.